is um, Derek's PhD advisor and the uh, black body target that I'll show at some point in, in the slides was uh, came out of uh, an idea that uh, uh, Bill had. Um, Vila Congas is uh, working on some uh, next generation microwave radiometers that ESA is planning to launch. Um, Ishikawa san is uh, involved with uh, AMSER, uh, both AMSER, the one that's up in orbit right now, plus hopefully some, a future one um, that's not officially confirmed yet, but everybody's hoping there's going to be another one. And uh, Bill Bell's over, uh, a uh, NWP um, researcher over at uh, Easton WF. Uh, and then Dave Walker uh, also uh, sort of uh, tried to keep this idea alive while he was uh, working at NIST. All right, so uh, the outline is pretty straightforward. I'll talk about um, what microwave radio calibration is. I'll, I'll give a, a really quick introduction just in case uh, some of you may not be that familiar with it because it's so fundamental to the rest of the talk. And then I'll uh, explain what SI traceable calibration actually means in the context of microwave radiometer calibration. Then I'll talk about the why, like why should you even care about this, who, who you know, what, what sort of benefits might there be uh, if we were to uh, be fortunate enough to get uh, SI traceable calibration. Uh, and then I'll talk about the how, uh, what sorts of, what pieces of the puzzle exist right now what work remains to put them together so that we can actually uh, achieve this. Um, and this is ongoing work, so I don't have final answers. There's probably loads of mistakes in here, uh, but I thought by, by, start, you know, by coming and talking to smart people, we'll find out where the mistakes are and fix them. Uh, so feel free to point out any mistakes I've made, especially if I violated any laws of physics. Um, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, the what the background. Uh, most of you here are probably familiar with microwave radiometers, but uh, I'll, have, I'll have one or two slides on that, and I'll go through that real quickly. Then I want to spend a little bit of time just explaining in a very, uh, very general, very high-level way uh, something about radiometer calibration, so that so that we can talk about the traceability part. Uh, and then, because it's very relevant, I'll also talk about uh, the relationship between the SSI traceability uh, and uh, um, GNSS uh, radio occultation, which uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with, too. Okay, so this is my uh, cartoon picture of uh, what passive microwave or radiometers are used for, which bands, and which sensors, uh, which satellite sensors have which bands. So the top part here in this light blue, uh, each of these boxes represents different scientific application area, snow, sea ice, for example. And the, uh, uh, the location of the, of the bars corresponds to the microwave frequency bands that you would use if you were interested in those applications. Down below here in the darker blue are, are bars, again, that show which bands uh, exist on particular satellite uh, microwave radiometers. It's not, it's not intended to be a complete list, but just to give you an idea, uh, the different applications use different bands, uh, and different satellites have different bands. Um, I, as, as John mentioned, I, I do work uh, a lot, and many of you here also work on uh, ATMS and sounders. Um, and uh, those sounders, those sounder observations are, have been shown to have uh, the largest impact for, uh, among different kinds of data that are in, ingested in the models. So they're, they're very important. And calibration is therefore important. Okay, so what is a microwave radiometer? It's basically a non-contact thermometer. Uh, it, you, you know, you don't have to touch the thing that you're trying to measure. Um, but it measures brightness temperature, not physical temperature. And the relationship between those two is uh, connected by this thing called emissivity. Uh, so your brightness temperature is not necessarily the same as your physical temperature. Uh, it is if your emissivity is exactly one. So this tells us a way that you can calibrate a microwave radiometer. If you have a target whose emissivity is one or really close to one, then you know what its brightness temperature should be by just measuring the physical temperature of that target. 
So this is a very simple, very straightforward way to calibrate something. Uh, and if, you're, if you do that, you're now calibrated at that one brightness temperature. So how do you use this to calibrate over a range of temperatures? Um, you first, and this is my highly simplified version, first you try to make your instrument as linear as you possibly can. Uh, and then if it's linear, or at least over the linear range, uh, you only need two points to calibrate that, that linear uh, transfer function. So uh -huh. you just have to use, you just need black body targets at two, uh, two different temperatures. You'd like them to be as far apart as possible. Uh, but in, in theory, this is all you need. Um, so there's a picture on the left here of a typical uh, actual physical black body target. Uh, there's one of these on just about every microwave radiometer that's ever been launched into space, uh, at least the smaller microwave radiometers. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a, um, it's a 2D array of, of metal pyramids. It looks like some sort of medieval torture device. Uh, the black coating is the actual uh, it's a material that has an emissivity of one at these wavelengths. So here's uh, up in the corner, here's a picture of ATMS, uh, the top part of ATMS, and these two holes are the uh, observing apertures. They are on a uh, rotating structure, so that's how you get a scan of the Earth, that's how you get a, a swath. Um, so right now this instrument's sort of up, the photo's upside down. Actually this part uh, points down to look at the Earth. So in this diagram here on the right, uh, the circle just represents that circular scan. So during the entire life of ATMS, and this is also true of all the other sounders, the thing just spins. And as it spins, you know, as it goes down, looking straight down or, uh, near Nader, it's looking at the Earth. Uh, but then during other portions of this circular scan, it looks at, uh, remember that target from the previous slide? You can if you, can put, if you can fit one inside your instrument, and there is one of these inside here, um, that gives you a hot calibration point. And then during another portion of the circle, it actually looks straight out at cold space. Uh, and we know the brightness temperature of cold space based on first principle calculations given that it's a, uh, from the, the fact that you're looking at the cosmic microwave background. So, so it's another uh, black body target with an emissivity of one. All right, so now we get into SI traceability. Uh, what is it? Uh, so this is this is what this slide's all about. What SI traceability is. The next slide's about what trace, SI traceability isn't. Uh, so again, uh, really traceability means that you have an unbroken chain uh, that links the measurement you've made back to some sort of standard. If your standard happens to be an SI standard, your traceability is SI traceability. Pretty pretty simple. Each of these little loops represents a link in this chain. Um, so let's translate that into uh, microwave radiometers. Well, you have a Cal target, just like you saw in the previous slide. You measure its physical temperature. You know its emissivity is one, so you know its brightness temperature. So this is a standard. That's an example of a standard. All right. And then you have your microwave radiometer and all its little uh, sub-assemblies inside, but it gives you a measurement, a measurement of brightness temperature. So you want to connect uh, the standard over on the left to your measurement over on the right, and you have to do it through uh, a chain, an unbro unbroken chain. So you can imagine, you know, you've got your physical temperature uh, that you're measuring with a, a you know, a, a measurement, an actual sensor that's attached to the uh, um, microwave target, and then you have this, this part here where there's no physical, things aren't touching, right? Your, your Cal target isn't actually touching your radiometer. However, the, the energy emitted, the brightness temperature that's emitted is received, or some portion of that is received by your, your measurement instrument. So, so there's some magic that happens here that you, have to get, that you have to get right in order to have an unbroken chain. <coughs> uh, the other great thing about this traceability, so this is, this is standard stuff for people who work in the standards world, right? There's nothing new here that we're inventing. Uh, and this is already done done for the visible and IR instruments. It's been, been around for, for years. Right? And one of the things they do when they construct this, this chain is they very rigorously quantify the uncertainties for each link in the chain so that when you, when you assemble the full chain, you know the total uncertainty. Uh, and that, that's another key part. In fact, that's probably the biggest key part of, of what you get from, from traceability. So 
your uncertainties get very rigorously quantified, and you get a total uncertainty uh, with respect to the standard. Um, so this is this is really the, the fundamental thing that you get from from traceability. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what it, what traceability is not. Uh, you you do get this this rigorous uh, uncertainty assessment. If you if your reference is an as an SI standard, you're connected to some fundamental SI unit. This doesn't this doesn't mean that if you somehow manage to achieve SI traceability, that your measurement suddenly became amazingly at more accurate than it was yesterday. It just means that you know the size of your error bars more rigorously. So SI traceability doesn't mean that you suddenly, you know, you're, you're all of your uncertainty shrunk. It just means that you, you know, it might actually grow because maybe you assume that they're small, your error bars are smaller, but by by the rigorous analysis, it shows that your error bars are actually bigger. You just know them better. A really good example. Many of you are probably familiar with the XCal activity that GPM has. You know, GPM is a constellation of microwave radiometers. Um, they've, they've harmonized. <coughs> another word you see often. Uh, they've, they've figured out the relationship between the brightness temperatures uh, among the different members of the constellation. According to standards people, this is intercomparison, not intercalibration. Because the reference, in the, in the GPM case, they've used, they're using GM, the GMI radiometer as their open reference. That reference isn't traceable to a standard. So you don't have that, that, that unbroken link. There's a link missing. Um, if you could add that missing link to a, and, and make it traceable to a standard, then you go from intercomparison to intercalibration. Right? If that standard happens to be SI traceable, you now have SI traceable intercalibration. And again, uh, so now it, if you've actually connected to a standard, you, you have an uncertainty analysis that gives you, uh, that allows you to quantify absolute calibration. So I'm going to use, you may hear me uh, use the word absolute calibration, traceable calibration. I'm going to use those interchangeably. Uh, somebody from NIST might, might quibble with me about that. But for purposes of this presentation, let's just say that they're basically the same thing. So a uh, big question here is, all right, great, traceability sounds wonderful, but you have your choice of traceability, uh, you have your choice of standards. So which, which SI unit do you want to be traceable to? Well. Uh, Radio occultation is SI traceable through the frequency standard. So radio occultation measures the path delay, fundamentally, of signals. Uh, and there are, there's, some, there's some modeling involved. You have to model the atmosphere, essentially. So there, there are different places where, where you have uncertainties that need to be quantified. Um, it's also good over, it's, it's, it works best over a particular range of altitudes within the atmosphere. Horizontally, it's got relatively large footprints, but it gives you fairly decent vertical resolution. The uh, traceability that I'm talking about in this presentation is with, with respect to brightness temperature, which would be linked to the Kelvin, the temperature standard. Um, so again, there's, and it's a little bit more of a direct link to a standard, right? Um, it's, it's, it works well over a whole range of, uh, of altitudes within the atmosphere. You get similar vertical resolution. You get smaller footprint sizes. Um, but both of these are complementary. They, they would both help constrain, for example, a uh, you know, weather prediction or an atmospheric state within an NWP model. Um, OK, so let's, let's talk a little bit here uh, in this section about uh, the benefits, like wh why, why would this why should anybody care about trying to do this? Uh, so I'll give uh, <coughs> I'll give some examples. Um, first, one having to do with constellation systems, which I've already kind of alluded to. Then I'll I'll give uh, an example each for uh, <coughs> P applications and um, fundamental climate data record, and also what I call regular retrieval. So we talked about. Uh, the benefit of traceability to calibrating a single radiometer. Now imagine you have a constellation. GPM is the obvious example, but for example, uh, Steve Volz and many other people, you know, are thinking have have visions of, of future uh, sounder systems. For example, that would include maybe you know some of the ATMS class sounders, but then also uh, combined with a bunch of CubeSats. Well, CubeSats are great because they're smaller, they're cheaper, etc but smaller means that it's harder to put a calibration target on them. It, it, it imposes limitations when it comes to calibration. So if 
you actually want to really exploit something like QTAS and incorporate QSAT observations with, uh, say, ATMS-style observations, you're going to need to figure out how to intercalibrate all of those. So over here in the top right, this picture is intended to show or to sort of uh, uh, visualize the concept that every single one of these radiometers in a constellation will have its own separate calibration line. So that's what each one of these red lines, and they're not going to all be the same. Right? You go and build 10 radiometers, even if they're supposedly identical, and I guarantee you, you'll get 10 different calibration lines. So how do you make these all, you know, what, what do you do? You have to, you can take the GPM approach, um, which is actually a very good approach, um, and you can also do things on the ground pre-launch. Right? So the, the targets that I'll be showing, uh, the target that I'll be showing a little bit later in the presentation is something that you can actually uh, use pre-launch. So uh, pre-launch intercalibration would, would shrink the spread on these lines. You could, you could find the relationship between the different calibration lines and effectively shrink them down to within the uncertainty bars that your traceable calibration would, would, would um, identify for you. And then the post-launch cal would have an easier job because you've done a lot of, a lot of this work uh, in the pre-launch uh, time frame. You'll still have to deal with footprint matching and other things that don't really exactly overlap with the, uh, the um, brightness temperature amplitude calibration that I'm talking about, uh, which is why I was uh, saying that you still, you still want the post-launch calibration. Um, now, it also appears that this pre-launch calibration can be extended to on orbit. And I'm not sure that I'll really have time. Maybe, maybe in the questions afterwards, we can talk about that. Uh, but then, then it would be possible to do SI traceable cal on orbit as well as pre-launch, um, and you can uh, have some some wonderful benefits from that too. Uh, so another uh, another example of where, um, especially in the post-launch um, time frame, uh, intercalibration would be uh, very useful is if you have gaps. So here in this in this lower right picture. The horizontal axis now is time, and uh, for example, you may have one satellite sensor that operates and then stops, and then there may be a time gap before you can launch the replacement. Uh, as I said, these two are going to have different calibrations. You certainly can't assume they're going to have the same. Uh, and so if you have traceability, especially traceability that goes either, either just pre-launch or pre- and post-launch, that'll help you bridge a gap like this. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, benefits of the traceability to NWP forecasting. Um, right now, the uh, forecast models subtract biases, and I'm not an expert at NWP, so this is where I'm probably going to get some things wrong, uh, so, so you all can help me. But uh, essentially, there are three, from talking to several uh, NWP folks, um, <coughs> there are three sources of, of bias. There's this bias from the sensor itself, there's bias in the uh, two models that are used to construct an NWP forecast, the radiative transfer, the forward model, as well as the, uh, the forecast model, which is the thing that has the atmospheric state in there as well. Uh, the bias corrections are actually larger than the residual model errors currently, uh, which is a little bit worrisome, maybe. Um, and uh, there's a reluctance to, so there's, so you have some error coming from source number one, some error coming from source number two, and some error coming from source number three. Uh, but how much is coming from one and how much is coming from two and three isn't really well known. Um, in fact, the S in, in some cases, in a lot of cases, apparently what they do is they attribute errors in number two and number three to two errors in number one. And we actually go, why would they do that? Uh, right, it's, it's unphysical, right? Well, it's convenient. So the models right now uh, are, are complex, and uh, the concern is that if you actually go and fix the physics, there's always side effects and, and consequences. If you fix something in the model over here, but it's a complex uh, system, you, there are going to be other changes that happen. Um, so there's some reluctance to, to go down that path. But that's the path you need to take if you're going to actually fix the physics in your model. So as models get better and the physics need to be more correct, uh, this, may, this may turn into an issue uh, somewhere down the road. So uh, traceable calibration would, would quantify uh, very uh, rigorously the error that's coming from the sensor, the actual sensor observation itself. 
So that, then, then now you know how much air is truly coming from this. And then you have a better idea of how much air is coming from the rest of the rest of the sources of air. So that's that's one way that that uh, this traceable cal would benefit NWP forecasting. Uh, so here's essentially what I said, but in in more official terms from from Bill Bell over in Ethan WF. Um, to say the forecast model errors are down in the neighborhood of a tenth of the Kelvin, the biases are sometimes, you know, like an order of magnitude larger. So, um, and and he does, you know, as I say, using more correct terminology than I did, uh, explain that it would be nice to, to be able to rigorously partition how much of your your bias is coming from what source. All right. So now now we'll talk about uh, FCDRs. Um, and I'm only going to focus on, on one, this is the brightness temperature FCDR. Uh, I found this on the, the uh, University of Colorado um, uh, group's website. But essentially, uh, they're trying to stitch together a consistent set of brightness temperatures across decades using observations from a series of mi satellite microwave radiometers as they, you know, as they operate and die and operate and die and so forth. You don't always have overlap. Fortunately, here you can see there is overlap, so you can you can uh, use various um, on-orbit calibration techniques that require uh, overlapping observations. But uh, in general, you can't assume that you're definitely going to have overlap. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you have a jump, uh, you know, a gap, uh, having an independent way to calibrate uh, could be very useful. Um, the brightness temperature may seem like an abstract concept, but remember this is a fundamental input quantity to a lot of geophysical retrieval. So uh, you, you want to get this right uh, so that you don't induce, you know, propagate errors further downstream. Uh, and also, you know, the, the, all of these FCDRs, one of their primary uses is looking for long-term trends like climatic trends, right? So how do you know when you see something that looks like a trend, how do you know if that's a real trend or if it's just calibration drift? And again, if you have an independent way to calibrate, you have a better chance of separating those before you publish that paper in Nature claiming that you found, you know, a, a climate change. Um, okay, so uh, this this I, I adapted from uh, again the uh, the Colorado FCDR website. There are a number of existing tools that, that are used to uh, to do uh, intercalibration or I guess intercomparison. Uh, coincident overpasses, different satellite sensors pass over the same spot within approximately the same time. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you do a comparison. Of course, you have to worry about the fact that uh, you've got different footprint sizes, different shapes, the, the you know, the orientations are different. Um, you get a lot of passes. Most of these sensors are polar orbiters. You get a lot of passes over the polar regions, uh, various double difference techniques, and then there's vicarious calibration techniques where, where you use geophysical phenomena and um, and you know limits that just happen to occur in nature to try to uh, create artificial uh, calibration targets using using the Earth. Um, so I, I highlighted this section in, in red, uh, you know, where they call out the fact that uh, because there's no such thing as an absolute calibration target for microwave radiometers, uh, they have to use other techniques. Uh, but um, you know, essentially, this says that it would be nice. It would be it would be better if you had such a thing. Uh, so, um, in short, you know, if you had a pre-launch uh, method of, of doing traceable calibration, uh, you would be able to better quantify these uncertainties, and uh, and that would help a lot with a constellation type situation. Uh, so I've already said most of this. I would maybe focus your attention on the last bullet down there from UMETSAT. So UMETSAT, of course, is interested in these long data records. And again, uh, they, they are you know, already aware that you need to stitch them together. You need to worry about gaps. And if you had uh, external references, independent references, that all of that would be, uh, would be easier. So now we'll come to what I call regular retrievals. Um, and this is where you're not doing an NWP model. Uh, you just take some, some data uh, directly from satellite brightness temperatures from uh, a radiometer, for example, and run them through a standalone retrieval algorithm. There's still lots of that, uh, you know, lots of uh, retrievals that look like that data products used operationally all over. Um, so I just have two examples here, soil moisture and snow water equivalent. Um, 
for both of these, they're, they're operational products that are produced just straight from the, uh, the brightness temperatures without doing any data assimilation or going through any kind of uh, global modeling scheme. Uh, and they need the, those retrieval algorithms uh, require the absolute brightness temperature. So if you give it a, an erroneous absolute brightness temperature, your retrieval has some bias in it, and, it, and it's typically nonlinear. So, uh, so these, there's a whole category of data products that would also benefit from accurate uh, and consistently accurate um, brightness temperature calibration, absolute calibration. Um, we talked about the constellation benefits and the gaps. Um, I did want to mention that you know that the traceable calibration doesn't necessarily mean that you no longer have to worry about uh, the fact that different sensors have different footprints. Uh, and that if you're comparing against uh, some sort of validation data, uh, you are, you're always going to have to worry about scaling issues. Maybe your validation came from a weather station at a point, but you're looking at a satellite pixel or a model grid cell. Um, you, you're, you're still, you still have to worry about um, uh, point to grid cell uh, scaling issues. However, you know, if you can better quantify the uncertainty associated with the original observation, presumably you have made uh, you've made your scaling more rigorous as well. All right, so now uh, in this last section, I'll talk a little bit about the, the technology. Um, so I mentioned the in the visible and infrared world, they've had uh, traceable SI traceable standards for a while. They they use them to calibrate um, satellite instruments that have been launched. Uh, they use them to calibrate um, airborne instruments. They use them to calibrate ground-based instruments. Um, so so there's nothing new here. Uh, the only problem in the microwave is there hasn't been a trace of a standard, a microwave standard, a black body standard for the microwave uh, wavelength until a few years ago uh, when NIST built uh, a prototype uh, target, and I'll show a picture in a second. Uh, and then I'll also show a little bit about the, the methodology. This is, this is an area where uh, work is ongoing. We don't, we don't have all the answers. We don't have a complete recipe yet. Uh, but so here's a picture of the target. Uh, this top uh, diagram is a, is a CAD drawing. Um, the bottom is a photograph of the actual black body. It's a hollow cone. So it's just a, it's a different physical configuration from the, the pyramids that I showed earlier. Uh, but this, the principle is sort of the same. You want to uh, ideally not have any reflectance. The definition of a black body is that if you shine some radiation on your black body, it absorbs all that radiation. Well, that means that it can't reflect anything. So you have to design something that absorbs all the radiation that, that you know that you uh, uh, illuminate it with. Um, and so this is a structure that that accomplishes that with, with in two ways. One, the material is an absorbing material to begin with, and then the shape, uh, as you can imagine, whatever reflections still occur as they bounce off the walls of this cone, those reflections get. Uh, directed deeper into the cone. So every time they touch the walls of the cone, they get absorbed a little bit more. So, so that's how, uh, that's how this, this works. Uh, so they, two of these were made. Um, the aperture sizes are designed to be big enough to calibrate the two apertures of ATMS. Uh, they're also designed to fit in the vacuum chamber that we use when we do pre-launch calibration of, of uh, ATMS. And uh, right now, we're in the process of uh, doing um, engineering tests. We need to do some more uh, analyses of the temperature uniformity uh, and, and all of those developmental details to make it a real usable uh, working target. The, uh, the coils here uh, are uh, tubing that you can run a, uh, a cooling fluid through. So that'll, and you hook that up to a, uh, you know, a temperature control unit. So that actually lets you vary the temperature of this to simulate, uh, you know, brightness temperatures or to, to be a, a, uh, uh, a standard over a wide range of, of brightness temperatures. Um, and then there would be temperature sensors attached to it as well. Um, and the, 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 um, the cooling tubing is, is wound around the whole thing to try to help with the, um, uh, to give you a, a nice uniform physical temperature. Uh, so the traceable, uh, the calibration methodology right now uh, is, uh, fairly straightforward and simple. Uh, again, remember you want that unbreakable chain of, of measurements. So um, imagine that you have your radiometer here, which has a rotating uh, aperture so that they can look at different things as it rotates. 
um, you want it to look at things that you, a standard, which in this case is our, our cone target, for example, and then you want to transfer the, the observation of the measurement made looking at the standard to the next thing in the chain, which could be uh, additional targets of a different type, for example. It could be additional uh, microwave radiometers. But in this kind of a configuration, you, you would look at your standard, and then as you rotate, you would look at your uh, the next thing you're trying to calibrate, which let's say is another uh, black body standard, for example, maybe a cold one or a hot one. And then by repeatedly doing this and adjusting uh, things, you would um, uh, you can you can transfer the, the, the calibration from the thing that you're sure about, which is your standard, to something that you know a, a new uh, a new standard. I'm sorry, a new target rather. Um, and then you can also do the same thing uh, if if you were if you had two targets that were uh, previously um, calibrated against each other, uh, you could also um, use those to calibrate a new radiometer. So if you had two knowns and one unknown, by going back and forth and looking at this and ensuring things are stable, you could you could transfer a um, calibration to from the target to the radiometer. Mm -hmm. I, I just uh, uh, want to understand this. So this is actually a matter you're talking about the ground, the ground calibration, right? That's right. So there's a, so so there's no like on where, where it's on the and well, then you but you are half body target, but but you do not have the, the, the another target. Then then you assume you are hard target on the on the uh, on the on the old that didn't change. But, but this is only for pre pre launch. So this is what you would do on the ground to transfer, for example, transfer calibration from a known, let's say the the cone target, which would be our standard, to a one of the pyramidal targets, for example, right? So let's say you did that for, uh, and, and in particular, let's say you did that for the pyramidal target that's actually inside ATMS mm -hmm. or whatever other microwave radiometer. A lot of a lot of those radiometers have. So so then that target that's inside your instrument has is now traceable to your standard. And, and, and the, and the, at that time. At that time, right. And then you launch it, yeah. right. How your sensor looks at that target, if that remains the same, if that hasn't changed from pre-launch to orbit, then on orbit, when it looks at the target, nothing's changed to within some uncertainty that you've that you've quantified. Right? So, so, so that's the part I don't understand. So will hot target on orbit uh, the quality change? Well, not not traceable in time. That's a part I don't, I don't know. I think what's important here is using this uh, as a standard say, um, warm load on the ground and transfer the as a capable uh, warm load sensitivity mm -hmm. to the how all the um, warm load you would use. Very important is this. Because if there is different measurement or different standards, mm -hmm. Because the, now the warm load has no standard. So the different vendor have the same mm -hmm. oh, environment, okay. the warm load and activity, mm -hmm. they have different methodology. Right. So that makes you know I some see. uncertainty of the uh, what's important here is transfer of standard. Right. But my question actually is will the back body target the quality require change on over with time? And how do you Every everything. I mean, if you, anything you put in space will eventually change to some degree over time. However, 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 what you do is is knowing why things change. You construct the target in a way that minimizes those changes. That's the whole. I mean, that's the design principle behind any onboard calibration device. You want to make it so that it changes as little as possible. You're not saying that I can guarantee that it's going to be zero change. You just know that, you know, in this case, uh, well, I don't know, different different materials uh, behave differently in the space environment, right? So if you know if you know how those those behavior uh, mechanisms will affect your target, 
you do everything in your power to design the target in such a way that its changes are going to be as small as possible. And you can quantify a lot of that, mm -hmm. right? So this gets back to this, this business of rigorously quantifying the uncertainties. So you can say, look, over the lifespan of this instrument, I know, based on experience, maybe ground-based exper uh, experiments that have been done and measurements, et cetera, characterizations, I know that my target has not changed more than plus or minus X. Right? So now that becomes a number that goes into your overall error budget. Right? And hopefully, if you've done a good job, you've made the X in plus or minus X really small, right? so that it's not the, hopefully not the dominant uh, driver in your, in your uh, overall uncertainty budget. Now, remember that the, in, the, in the ATMS example, this hot target that you calibrate on the ground, that you traceably calibrate to your standard on the ground, is literally the same target that's in the, it's in the instrument that gets launched in orbit. So you've, you've done this, tra this, this traceable cal, you've done the link to the standard on the ground, and then you've launched the same thing into space. This entire mechanism here where, you know, the rotating uh, uh, you know, um, uh, aperture that looks, that spins around and looks at the target is the actual ATMS itself in this example. All right, so this part and this part and the exact geometry, the, the materials, it is actually the same instrument that you launch into space. Now, remember, you need two points to do a calibration. So we've only talked about one. The other one on, in space is you look at cold space, right? On the ground, this would be a second uh, external pyramidal target. You know, it would be pretty much the same as one of these. It's just at a colder temperature, right? So the difference between, uh, for in the case of the cold target, the difference between the situation you have on the ground and the situation you have on orbit, those are going to be different, right? On the ground, you'd have a physical black body target. On orbit, you don't have a physical thing that you could touch. It's cold space, right? So there are differences. but Again, you can quantify those. I'm not saying that you're ever, remember, I never said, remember what I said at the beginning, traceable cal doesn't magically make your calibration better. It just means that you know those uncertainties more rigorously. So if you can quantify the differences between the situation you have on the ground and the situation you have in orbit, but on the ground, you, you did this transfer of calibration between the standard and this target, and then you, through analysis or whatever, experiments, what have you, you quantify the difference between the calibration with this target and a calibration using cold space. So you have that link between cold space and this target, and between this target and the standard, you have your unbroken link, and you know, and you've quantified the errors at every step of the link. So now you have a traceable cal. So it's possible in theory, we haven't actually calculated the numbers, but you could do this. It doesn't, it doesn't magically make your calibration better. It doesn't shrink the size of your error bars necessarily, but, it, but, but you will know the size of your error bars, whereas right now we don't. Well, there's different ways of doing it. So in the, in the ATMS example, every time you launch a new ATMS, the, this, this thing and this thing are part of the instrument. You would, you would put the new ATMS in there and you'd go through this procedure, right? And, and, and each, so each ATMS would be traceable to the standard target, All right? So you can imagine the standard target, different ATMSs or other, other radiometers, and for each one, there's an unbroken link going back to the same thing, the standard target. And, and it's, it's the common reference. It is, it's literally the thing that everything else is referred to. All right, so GPM has sort of, has basically kind of done it with on, you know, the XCAL effort. They've, they've figured out how uh, the relationship between brightness temperatures are observed by any one of the constellation radiometers back to the GMI radiometer. But the GMI radiometer isn't connected to something that you can actually call a standard. So they've done the biggest part. You know, there's an example of, you know, different radiometers being calibrated against something that's in common. In that case, the, the GMI radiometer. There's only one missing link, which is to then calibrate or link that, connect that, 
the calibration of that particular radiometer to a standard. If you could do that, if you could uh, add that missing link, then the entire constellation, in theory, becomes traceable to a standard. There, there is, yeah. I think I had it on the previous sensor. I had a picture of it somewhere, yeah. So this, this, is, an, this is a picture of the situation you have on the ground. In orbit, this gets replaced with cold, looking at cold space. Yeah. This, this, this would be replaced by cold space. The hub. This, 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 doesn't, this, this doesn't change. But you have a temperature sensor on this thing. In fact, you have multiple temperature sensors on it. And it's, it, remember, it's a black body. And black body means it has a mean of CO2 of 1, which means the brightness temperature is equal to the physical temperature. So you know the brightness temperature provided your temperature sensors are working. Or you know it to within the error bars of your temperature sensors plus whatever other error mechanisms are present. Again, you need that unbroken chain, but here you have the unbroken chain. Uh, so, yeah. So this could be done Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are, I mean, uh, the design of, of any of those pyramidal black body targets or, or the hollow cone, it doesn't matter. Uh, ideally, you'd want the entire structure to be uh, at a single temperature, right? Completely uniform in, in three dimensions. In practice, that's impossible. Or you can you do it as best as you can. So, so the design of a black body is always a trade-off between wanting the, the temperature uniformity, but also wanting something that doesn't have reflections. So, for example, the hollow cone. The longer and th you know and skinnier you make the cone, the lower the reflections. But then, now it becomes harder for to make that thing a, a uniform temperature. So, there's, there's going to be a trade-off. And the same, the same is true of the pyramidal target uh, description. If you, if you make a, the, the pyramids longer and thinner, uh, you'll have lower reflections. It'll be a, a better black body, but the temperature gradients are going to be bigger. So, so you have a trade-off. But yes, there, there are concerns, considerations like that when you're actually designing a, uh, a black body. OK. Um, so I'd say it's still a work in progress, but this is a basic uh, technique. You apply this, you know, you can, you can uh, construct a unbroken chain of measurements. And, and, and then you have to quantify the uncertainty associated with each link in the chain so that at the end you have this unbroken link. You know all the uncertainties. You've got traceable calibration. I didn't say the calibration's better. You just know your error bar is better. Okay, so uh, it, it turns out that uh, one, of the, one of our co-authors, uh, Ishikawa-san, who works for uh, Mitsubishi Corporation. So Mitsubishi Corporation is the, the, uh, the company that um, has built all of the AMSERs in, J in Japan. Um, so they have a big interest in satellite radiometer calibration. So he was working with the ISO group, the International Standards Organization. Uh, and so now there actually is a, uh, an official ISO standard uh, related to calibration of satellite microwave radiometers, and it's and it's generic. It doesn't. You don't need a cone target. You can use whatever target you or targets you happen to have. But there's a set of procedures and so forth. So there's actually now an, an ISO standard, uh, and uh, there are some opportunities coming up to potentially apply this calibration to actual satellite microwave radiometers. I mentioned uh, the European ones on MEDOC second generation. In particular, the uh, the NWI and the NWS. So this is the imager and this is the sounder. Uh, they're both in, in construction right now. Uh, and with ATMS, there's possibilities of maybe uh, going through this calibration in one of the future ATMSs, uh, possibly also with the Japanese uh, answer, future answer. Uh, there's interest. Uh, you know, there are people who have already expressed interest in, in you know, if, if you have a working calibration technique, then uh, people who are designing and launching CubeSats would like to, uh, to apply it. Uh, and then there may be opportunities with other future uh, uh, sounders and images. Uh, so here's some pictures from uh, Vile Congas of the, uh, of the European uh, radiometers. Uh, here's the sounder. 
the imager, and then there's the submillimeter wave uh, imager uh, to look at clouds and ice. Um, so these are going to be launched. Uh, first, first ones will be launched very soon, and then continuing for for quite a long time. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, a whole series of these. Uh, and wouldn't it be wonderful if you could figure out a way to, to have traceable calibration for the whole series, uh, especially considering how long you know this series is going to exist. Uh, on the U.S. side, again, we have uh, ATMS on uh, at least at least two more of these, and then we don't we don't really know yet what what comes after that. But there'll be something. There'll be some sounder. I mean, there's there's always going to be a microwave sounder, basically. Maybe it'll be a sounder plus a bunch of CubeSats. Uh, okay, so kind of in summary, I mean, uh, uh, we talked about the the, the prototype um, hollow cone target and uh, that, um, the traceability. You know, what what is SI traceability? Um, how you would use the the, um, uh, the any black body standard? Uh, what the benefits would be for constellation systems, uh, NWP, FCDRs. Uh, and uh, what I was calling regular retrievals. I'm hoping to continue working on the target. As I said, there's still some engineering uh, work that needs to be done, and then we actually have to try it and demonstrate that you can actually use it. Um, but there are opportunities to, uh, you know, assuming we can do all that, there's some opportunities to actually use this with some upcoming actual uh, microwave radiometers. And then uh, I mentioned that there is this new uh, ISO standard. Uh, so now uh, I didn't. This is this is a surprise quiz at the end of the at the end of the presentation. Um, anybody care to to venture a, a guess an answer? There's some sort of big vote coming up next month. Important. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> nobody. Nobody. Nobody wants to. Nobody wants to venture into this. Uh, okay. All right. Oh, I see. There's a vote next month by the international body that that, that oversees the the definition of the SI system, and uh, they are voting to accept the new definitions for these four units. Remember, there's seven seven fundamental SI units, and four of them have new definitions, uh, and the international body is supposed to vote next uh, next month. So you're probably saying, who cares? Uh, well. well uh, they, so they vote on them next month, and then in May on World Metrology Day, uh, the the um, new definitions will be put into effect. So it turns out that uh, you know you probably don't follow this, right? This is really obscure stuff. Right? <laughs> Most of the fundamental units, like the second and the meter and stuff, have been defined in terms of quantum mechanical uh, things, right? They've been gradually changing them over the over the years. So there's only one fundamental unit left that's defined in terms of a physical artifact. Um, it's the kilogram. The kilogram is still officially defined in terms of this block of metal that's sitting in a vault in, in Paris. <laughs> uh, but uh, they've been concerned that, that the weight of that official kilogram has actually been changing. And it's not; it's no longer uh, good to be defined in terms of a physical uh, artifact. So they, they figured out a way to define the kilogram in, in quantum mechanical terms. That's, that's, that'll be the last one. So uh, hopefully, the vote next month will um, will go as planned, and then and then next May, all all the fundamental SI units will be defined in terms of quantum mechanical uh, entities. All right. Thank you. Oh, Mark, question. Question. The, the first question is, uh, um, uh, you didn't give any number about uh, how bad we are now and uh, how good uh, we can become after we have this uh, uh, IS traceable uh, for microwave. So can you give some uh, uh, numbers? So the NIST has predicted that the uh, size of the, the uncertainty error bars for the conical target alone, not the whole chain, not the entire chain, just the target, is around a couple tenths of a Kelvin. That's absolute calibration. Okay. 
So how bad are we are now? Does anybody know? I think of, at least we have a rough estimation, right? Um, because um, we we always have a, a temperature sensor in the tar on the target, and uh, we usually we have an estimation or measurements of the, the EVC as well. So that would be relative calibration. Yeah, even relative hot. So we still we still know how bad. Uh, Somewhere in the neighborhood of you know a few tenths to Kelvin. It depends on which satellite radiometer you're talking about, which frequencies. Um, yeah. Well, we can test the absolute calibration accuracy requirement is roughly about half to one tenth. Well, in in that range, it, it varies a lot. I mean, you know, things like SMAP or SMOS that are you know, have apertures that are meters in size, uh, the calibration is, you know, quite different. Um, so. Okay, thank you. And second, second question is that uh, this, uh, like, a magic uh, cone uh, standard target, uh, why they didn't do it, like, uh, uh, 50 years ago? Why they do it now? I think it's, it's uh, there's no technique uh, uh, obstacle, like, a long time ago. They should have, can build this uh, a long time ago. Uh, no, that's a good question. Uh, my understanding is that uh, it's not a totally new idea. The radio astronomers uh, did, were the first ones to, to come up with the idea, and they are actually using them to, to calibrate their some radio telescopes right now. Um, so, I mean, um, the hollow cone has certain advantages over the pyramidal type of target, but, you know, it's also got some disadvantages. So it's another trade-off. Uh, you, you could you could argue in certain cases that maybe uh, the pyramidal type target would have uh, smaller uncertainty bars. Uh, uh, I, I didn't mean the type. I mean the standard. Why they didn't get oh. produce the standard a long time ago? That's an excellent question. It's uh, it, it's a little more, it is a little more challenging. Uh, it's the, the wavelengths are you know the much longer for microwaves. So whereas a uh, a black body for IR can sometimes be you know like soot, you know just a, a thin film of something. Um, yeah, uh, it could be very you know, but. Um, Microwave black bodies tend to be, you know, they they have to be some thickness relative to a wavelength because the absorption has to occur over, you know, either a significant fraction of a wavelength or multiple wavelengths. Uh, you're, you're, you're not going to get an absorbing material that works like a good black body that's, you know, like a hundredth of a wavelength thick. It's just physically, you, you can't find the materials. So um, uh, they're bigger. you got to find the right formulation. Um, Derek, the PhD student who, who worked on that, uh, you know, um, uh, conical black body target, he spent a, uh, a significant part of his time working on, you know, mixing different materials together to get uh, good low reflectivity over the wavelength range of interest. So it's part art, <laughs> part uh, science. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's a good question from Jim, but uh, I would like to say the ad already shows uh, there is a chain. So the, this blackboard is just the last part. So chain actually amplifies the, uh, the uncertainty. So for the micro things, I, well, my experience told me is the chain actually the, the amplifies very large in comparison to the IR things. So I think so either the people are talking about like 0.05 having something as the absolute calibration, but the microwave sensor today we are still talking about like uh, probably half degree something. So that's either the we need a lot of work about the chain between them. That's it, very important. Also, those chain is depend on instrument. For different instrument, are different. That's a, that's a hard for microwave sensor. Every, everything's everything is bigger with microwaves, harder to work with. 
actually a question for Mark. Yeah. So you talked about the point five.